You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I'm Paul Garner. And I'm Todd Wood. Uh, Don't forget, uh, as always, we remind you to uh, like, share our episodes, subscribe, uh, leave us a positive review on your favorite uh, streaming platform. All of that is uh, great, really helps us to reach new listeners. Uh, and uh, if you uh, are so inclined, if you're enjoying what we're doing on the podcast and you'd like to support us, um, then you can also uh, donate uh, to help us keep this content coming. Um, you can go to our uh, webpage, letstalkcreation.org, and you'll find all of the information there about how you can make a donation and uh, help us to keep the podcast going. That it would be very welcome indeed. Um, now, Todd, this is interesting because last uh, episode, um, we had intended to kind of do a a self-contained episode. We were all going to get it done, you know, within the hour. And actually, the topic was so fascinating uh, and kind of ran on um, much longer than we expected. There was much more to cover that we decided that we would split this into two. So this has become a two-parter. Yeah. So, Todd... Remind us what we were talking about last episode. Yeah, let's see if I can do that. Um, so this, this is part of our ongoing radiometric dating series. So this is yet another episode in that series again. Um, and we thought it would be useful and interesting to sort of start looking at other clocks. So if you think of radiometric dating as a clock, there's a certain process that happens at a particular rate. And... If you just extrapolate backwards, you can sort of estimate the time at which the process began. Um, Well, there are other processes that have rates as well, and we can do similar things. We can extrapolate backwards in time and try to figure out how long has this been going on. And so what we did, we had a special guest, Monty Fleming, come on and explain to us um, in great detail about continental erosion. Um, so if you uh, live uh, anywhere near the coast, you're probably familiar with this phenomenon where the ocean or the sea uh, is basically taking away uh, the land. It's basically eroding it down. And it's happening, for example, uh, on the east coast of the U- United States, it's happening at about a meter a year. That's about three feet every year. So that's literally within a lifetime. If you have a house set up on a sea cliff overlooking the ocean, you might not have that before by the time you retire. So you might think about uh, moving before you go moving there, right? (laughs) Um, And now, if you if you think about that, and you think about well, if it's happening that fast, then that would mean basically he said that the whole the whole North American continent gets eroded away in basically 4 million years. And based on conventional geology, that continent is supposed to be 200 million years old. So that would mean there'd have to be something happening that's compensating for that in order for the continent to really be 200 million years old and not eroded away by the ocean. So we went through a bunch of those possibilities. We considered we considered earthquakes and tectonic movements that raise the land out of the ocean, and we've discovered that, well, you'd have to raise the land hundreds of kilometers out of the ocean in order for the erosion rate to keep the continent together without eroding it away into the into the ocean. Um, we <laughs> So that was one thing that I learned that was quite fascinating. I think it was 400 kilometers. I think that was what was mentioned at one point was the height would have to be 400 kilometers based on the erosion rate of the sea, which would mean the, the you know, my house would be knocking into the International Space Station, which would be, I think, rather inconvenient. Anywho, um, and then uh, there was also the consideration of the possibility that maybe there's new continental crust forming. And so maybe what's happening is that beneath of us, it's not just earthquakes and so forth that are raising the continent up, but that, that we have um, new crust actually happening. And it turns out 
uh, based on the research that he presented, that no, in fact, the continents are super, super old. They're way older than uh, the the visible fossil record, most of it. So we would expect if erosion was taking continents away, and there are still continents, that most of the continental crust would have to be rather young. And it turns out, no, most of the continental crust, the core of the continental crust seems to be super old. And so that would suggest that there hasn't been that much erosion at all, which is really hard to understand. It's, it's very puzzling. I was left with this idea that I, I'm not sure how... So we have, on the one hand, you have this, this radiometric dating clock, which I think most geologists would say, this is the gold standard, right? This is because of the physics involved in the way that radioisotopes decay. We're going to defer to that. And the erosion thing has to be sort of figured out in some way. And we just don't know right now what that is. And I... That seems, that seems suspiciously familiar to me, like with creationists saying, well, we're pretty sure the Earth must be thousands of years old, but I'm not quite sure how to, how to solve this um, problem with the radiometric dating issue. It's almost like we're kind of saying the same kinds of things. I, I don't want to go too far down that road of accusation there, but they, that sounds suspiciously familiar. The other thing that I remember from this episode that was really cool to me that I thought was fascinating was that <laughs> he quoted a, a skeptical website, the Rational Wiki. I don't know if we're going to link to that. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Um, they don't need the traffic. Um, <laughs> and their, their argument was that stuff that gets eroded off the continents gets deposited in other places, which I thought was very amusing because that's not true. <laughs> once, once something is eroded off into the basin, the ocean basin, there's, there's nobody going around dredging. There's no natural process dredging sand off the bottom of the ocean and putting it somewhere back onto the continent. That's, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't happen unless you have uplift, right? You'd have to have uplift. So it's not like there's a redeposition going on. The only, the only place, and this was something he also pointed out, the only place where you have new continent forming like that is river deltas, which that makes sense. Uh, but that's not erosion coming off the continent, the coastal erosion coming off the continent. That's interior erosion, which I guess brings us to part two, which is yeah. there are other kinds of erosion going on, and we should consider those as well as we think about, you know, how fast erosion happens and can the continents really be hundreds of millions, maybe billions of years old. Yeah. Yeah, that indeed brings us to, to part two. We are welcoming back uh, our very special guest, uh, Dr. Monty Fleming. Uh, Monty, welcome again. Thank you. Uh, now, just to recap for those uh, you know who may be joining us this time, um, Monty uh, is based at Loma Linda University. Um, he can say a word or two about his uh, you know current sort of position there. Um, but I wanted to mention his book because this was the it was reading this book. Uh, stories about Earth's history, a geologist's descent from deep time, that kind of really put me onto this uh, subject. And, um, you know, we wanted to get Monty on the podcast. So, Monty, you're very welcome. Um, just briefly, sort of, for, for our listeners today, recap, you know, who, who you are and what you do at Loma Linda. I teach geology at Loma Linda University, and I've been doing research in... Uh, applied sedimentology recently. Um, mm -hmm. I've built a flume here and a sediment feed and just reconstructing different sedimentary structures under known parameters. It's always nice to get, like we can learn a lot in the field, but it's nice to see, see the processes happening in the lab and then go and compare that to the field. Yeah, that's great. And at some point, you know, maybe we, we'll have you back on to talk about all of that, because that, that's fascinating too. But we wanted to kind of pick up the thread that we began last time about uh, erosion. And as Todd has been explaining, we were sort of focused really on coastal erosion, what's happening on the margins of the continents. But of course, that's only one of the factors we need to take into account. There are lots of other ways that the continents are vulnerable to erosion 
So maybe we could sort of pick up there. Tell, tell us about what some of those other aspects of the erosion problem uh, you know, we need to be thinking about. Uh, well, uh, so a lot of sediment and dissolved continental material is carried to the ocean by rivers and streams every year. I'll show you this article here. So uh, this is probably the most famous article. And the value that they state in the article is about 15 billion tons of sediment per year. Wow. And uh, this article lists an additional 4 billion tons of dissolved solids that are transported to the ocean every year by rivers. And then another 5% or so is Eolian. It's blown in by the wind. And you know, that one's interesting. Um, when I, when, I, when I started doing the research at first, I didn't think of Eolian transport to the ocean as a big deal. But then I found this article and I was thinking about it. And when I was in Switzerland, my friend pointed up to the sky and he said, you see all that dust up there? It's from the Sahara. So there is actually a significant Eolian component as well. Yeah. So we've got these three um, kind of types of material that's being removed essentially from the continental interiors. So we've got essentially particulate matter so sediment that's being carried as kind of solids in uh, suspended in the water um in in the rivers and then you've got dissolved material uh and then you've got the windblown material so we've got these three sources in in effect of material that's then being removed from the continent so i mean how how these numbers sound very big 15 billion tons a year or whatever it is 4 billion tons here of dissolved material um how how significant is is this in terms of you know removing continental material so according to the above estimates if we just count 15 billion tons of sediment uh that would be enough to level the continents in 22 million years oh wow <laughs> And if we include the four tons of dissolved solids, that takes it down to 17 million years. And if we include the Eolian sediment supply to the ocean, it cuts it down by another one or two million. Goodness. And we're reacting because the continents are supposedly hundreds right. of millions of right, years right. old. Now, and you're and telling we, us. You know, of course, there's yeah. isostatic rebounds. So it, it's like if you have an ice cube floating in the top of a cup of water and you knock the top off, it's going to pop up a little higher, right? And you keep yeah. knocking the top off, and it'll keep popping up. You know, you take ten percent off every time, and it'll keep rising. But w w I guess we would, if if that's the solution to this problem, we'd kind of run into the same issue that we saw before, where exactly. um, right. you, you, you're going to be eroding effectively older rocks, and you're going to get through the whole thickness of the crust pretty pretty right. quickly. And, and yeah, okay, yeah, in. I ran into an interesting conundrum on this one. It, when you look at the amount of sediment that is trapped, that gets impounded behind dams and reservoirs, it looks like approximately 50 or maybe even 60 cubic kilometers of sediment collects behind the world's dams every year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an enormous amount. And so that is one out of five millionth of the continental volume above sea level. I mean, it's one out of like 2.4 millionth, but, but the, I, I did make a mistake in the book because I assumed equivalent density. Um, and when I actually went and dug into that later, the, the sediment that collects behind dams is not compacted like the sedimentary record in the, on the continents is. And so the actual mass is about one in five million, one out of five million. So in other words, in 5 million years, an amount of sediment equivalent to all of the land on Earth above sea level would collect behind the existing dams and reservoirs. Wow. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, just, yeah, it's just mind-blowing. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, and that doesn't include dissolved solids, and that doesn't include the really fine particles that don't settle out before they escape over the dam again. So we've got this sort of vast... Um, quantities of material that are being um you know essentially washed out into the oceans um by the rivers we're running uh, effectively what you're saying is into the same problem that we saw last time with coastal erosion that this can't be sustained yeah. for the kinds of time spans that we're talking about that we derive from radiometric dating unless there's some kind of compensatory compensatory process going on 
So that's fascinating. So the, the, the process that should compensate for that would be uplift. Now, I, I don't know what percentage of the sediment in the rivers of the world is deposited behind dams versus the amount that actually makes it out to the ocean. Of course, that's changed dramatically over the last hundred years. And we, we can see, like, for example, in California, we've diverted a lot of the, uh, almost all of our Southern California water, we've diverted it to agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so that sediment is not ending up at the ocean. And normally you would get that sediment going out to the beach and creating these nice sandy beaches, um, at least up until uh, there's a submarine canyon, and then it would go down that canyon. And then, you know, beyond the canyon, you'd have a rocky beach until another stream come give, give sediment input, and then you get another sandy beach. And so on the California coast, we, we have sandy beaches and rocky beaches, and you can tell where the submarine canyons are by looking at the, where the sandy beaches and rocky beaches are. Uh, there is a problem in California because of agriculture where we're not getting as much sediment out. And so they, they're actually, you know, they, that creates more coastal erosion. And then there's a problem like the Mississippi Delta is actually losing ground as well uh, because of, you know, the sediment's just not making it out to the Delta. And it's not, I mean, it's many rivers around the world where the dams are collecting the sediment. It's not making it out. So the Mississippi Delta is shrinking as deltas do. As, as the sediment consolidates. Uh, so that's creating trouble for wildlife. Uh, and then, well, anyway, so it's hard to know, uh, you know, there's, there's estimates out there, but it's hard to know exactly how much sediment would have made it to the ocean before the construction of all the dams. Uh, and then there's the other confounding factor, which is um, agriculture can actually increase sedimentation. So anyway, it, it's an interesting conundrum to try to sort out. I am suspicious that the estimate for fluvial sediment getting to the ocean is is too low. Two reasons. One is that in my own experiment, it's, in my own experiments in the flume, I can see that bed load. I can actually measure bed load, which is something you can't do in a in a stream or river. And I can see that. The Explain load, what you mean. Explain to our listeners what you mean by bed load. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So so suspended load is is the sediment that is suspended in the water as the water travels, and the bed load is the sediment that gets pushed along the bottom by the current. And yeah. so you can have a, a current pushing pretty large particles along the bottom that there's no way that it has enough energy to carry those particles in suspension, but okay. it can push them along the bottom and it can push a significant amount of material along the bottom. And so there are a lot of equations out there in the public lit literature for estimating bed load. I'm just suspicious that the estimates are too low in general. It's this something I, I, I would like to do more research on, at least in certain environments, I think the estimates are too low. And one of the reasons I think the estimates are too low is that I think the, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious when a dam fills up with sediment, like they know, they know the volume, they know how much sediment got deposited. And it's, it's odd to me that you could level the continent in 15 million years, just from the sediment going out to the ocean, but in just five million years, the same amount of sediment could collect behind the existing dams and reservoirs. That seems like a, <laughs> seems like a quandary. So uh, yeah. can I ask you a question? Cause, yeah. Cause I'm, I'm dying to know this. If, if these dams around the world are, is there like a dredging project to get this stuff out of there? So it doesn't clog the whole thing up. Is that happening? So, uh, so yes. Yeah. Yeah. So some okay. dams do get dredged to extend their usable lifespan. Wow. Um, a lot of dams are built with, you know, a hundred years. They like the engineers just say, this is going to be good for a hundred years and then it's done or 50 years. I, I was not expecting that answer. So, so, <laughs> so there's some places they just sort of cut their losses and say, this is good for a century. And then, right. then it's somebody else's right. problem. And, yeah, no. And, and unfortunately when they don't have a plan, um, it really becomes somebody else's problem. Because eventually that reservoir that everybody loves to go boating yeah. on and water skiing and tubing and all that stuff, that's just going to be a big, flat, muddy plain that's going to eventually just turn into yeah. land. Well, that's inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> now, g given um, w what you've been sort of telling us so far, so we've, we've got this vast amount of material that's being sort of flushed down the rivers. A lot of it today as you say, is kind of building up behind dams. Um, but let's, let's kind of, and you say it's hard to, 
try to estimate how much sediment would have been reaching the ocean uh, in the period before the, there were the dams um, in place. But can we can we try to sort of put some numbers on that? I mean, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the in the conventional model, obviously there weren't these um, man-made dams for for most of Earth history. So that material was presumably, or at least a large proportion of it, was reaching the ocean. Some of it then getting flushed down submarine canyons. Is there enough sediment on the floor of the ocean basins? Is is the amount of that sediment what we would expect from 200 million years of erosion of the North American continent? Or is there a problem yeah, there? A with question. Well, so first, I, I have one note of caution about people who, who want to go dig into this online. I found a couple of sources that said that there was 100 billion tons of sediment trapped behind the world's dams. And that is actually a tiny fraction of the amount that's actually trapped. I don't know where they got that value. 100 billion sounds like an oddly round number. I'm suspicious that somebody threw it out there and it got quoted. Because uh, I went through some, uh, like the World Bank did a, did a study on dams and reservoirs because they were, you know, of course, interested in the economic value and went through all of those numbers and it's it looks pretty robust and so I, that and that 100 gigaton figure just doesn't fit anything else i've found out there about the ocean uh, about the ocean basins it, there is somewhere between maybe one and two and a half times more sediment on the floor of the ocean than the continental mass above sea level Okay. So back to that. So I think that that first value that I gave of, of 15 billion tons plus plus another five or so billion, um, I think that's a good like starting value because we know that there. You know, I think we can say there's at least that much getting getting mm -hmm. dumped into the ocean every year. Um, so that means that in 15 or so million years, we should expect an equivalent quantity of sediment to get dumped into the ocean as the 800 meters of, of continent that we have above sea level right now. And so if that's been, if all that sedimentation has been going on for that much time, that's only, you know, maybe max 50 million years worth of sedimentation into the ocean. And the ocean basin hmm. is supposed to be a couple hundred million years old. So it seems there's a, there's a shortfall in the right quantity of the sediment in the ocean basins as well. Right. And, and, and it's an important point to note that that's not all continental, uh, material let me find the yeah yeah because some some of it obviously is generated within the ocean basins itself right. themselves yeah right so this is the this is sedimentation in the world's oceans uh from noaa and you can see that there's very little sediment in vast stretches of the ocean and then there's extremely thick sediment in or you know in the gulf and near the ganges delta so as an aside, it actually makes a lot more sense to me to have rapid continental plate motion, which then slows to a current rate, because otherwise I think you would expect to have more even distribution of, of sediment on the ocean floor. If that ocean floor formed very quickly, uh, then you can explain the low sedimentation. So that's, um, yeah, so that's rivers and uh, their input into the oceans now of course i guess people are going to then ask the question about whether you know mountain uplift can compensate for the material that's being eroded from the continents uh, we've already said that there is this problem you know about um eroding through the whole thickness of the, <laughs> right. the, the, the continents but perhaps we could just start to talk about what we know about erosion rates of mountains um because there have been some interesting studies on this as well haven't there yeah i think everest is a good mountain to talk about because it's been studied pretty well based on the sediment delivery from the mountains that that drain around from the rivers that that come off of the Him himalaya mountains um i, I would say 2.1 milli millimeters per year is a reasonable rate of erosion um, so if we divide the height of Everest by 2.1 millimeters, we get about 4.2 million years. So in other words, if erosion continued at the current rate, it would level Everest in 4.2 million years at just, you know, two millimeters a year, just 
taking it down that, that tiny bit. Everest is actually being uplifted though significantly faster than it's being eroded. The published rates disagree, but even the slowest rates, uh, they do create a conundrum when they're stretched out over tens of millions of years. Um, the slowest rate is about four millimeters per year of uplift and the fastest are up something like 65 millimeters a year. Oh, good grief. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, wow. that's fast. But what's that's interesting is that, so the very first measurement of Everest was 29,000 feet exactly. Mm. And they said, ah, that's an oddly round number. And so they added two, they added two feet. Um, and then the, the famous joke was that the guy that added two feet, 29,002 feet, um, was the first person to put two feet on Everest. <laughs> Dear groan. Hey. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, so that, yeah, that was the, uh, the that was the, the British surveyors that did that uh, back back when the, that area was a colony of England. Um, what's interesting though is that if, if they nailed that if they did their trigonometry well, if they really nailed the height of Everest, that 65 or so millimeters per year actually matches our current measurements, which are 29,000, 30, 30-ish feet. So that's interesting. I don't want to speculate too much on not, not too much data, but, but okay. So, well, back to the small measurement. If, if even the four millimeters per year, even at that rate, when you stretch it out over the 40 or 60 million years of Everest's supposed history, uh, it does create a problem because that would mean that over 50 miles of sediment would have, well, first off, you'd have 50 miles of sediment eroded off of the top as Everest grows, but this, there's still mm, marine sediment on top of Everest. Um, you can see a little bit in this picture from USGS, uh, there's, there's a limestone cap on the mountain. Mm -hmm. That limestone has uh, crinoids in it, you know, it's marine, it's got these marine organisms in it. Uh, it anyway, it's, it's hard to imagine that much sediment being eroded off of, off of the mountain. Um, and also, uh, Everest would just be vastly taller than it is. Um, and, you know, nobody thinks that that much sediment actually eroded off of the top. Mm. I, 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 ran, I ran into one article on Everest specifically and on the erosion rate, the article said at the, in the conclusion that the erosion rate of Everest must have been 50 times lower in the past than it is now. No mechanism. Wow. It just must have been that way. Yeah. 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 Just to, to basically make the numbers add up. You know. Right. Yeah. So it seems that there is, again, um, as we've been seeing all the way through these two episodes, there, there are some real time conflicts here when we compare radiometric timescales with some processes that we can sort of measure and we can quantify in terms of erosion rates, uplift rates. We, we run into some conundrums, that, and it, it seems that it's the long radiometric timescale that kind of creates these conundrums, it, right. it seems if, to me. If so, we yeah. suppose that 40 million years of history, then we would expect somewhere between 100 miles and 1,400 miles of uplift. You know, and hopefully this explains why uplift can't solve the problem for deep time, because very, you know, very similar to the coastal erosion problem where you, you need to recycle the crust 13 times in the history of the continent, you end up with exactly the same problem with mountain building. Now, do you, we, we've mentioned the Himalayas. I was just going to say, do, do we have effectively a similar conundrum when we look at uplift rates of other sort of high mountain ranges like the Andes or the Rockies and so on? I mean, do we, do, do we come up with similar numbers? Yeah, we do. It, it was much harder to find data, but when I did find data, it followed similar trends. Todd, you were going to ask a question, I think. How how thick, on average, is the continental crust? That's what I would like to know. Oh, it varies. It's significantly thicker under mountains, of course. Maybe okay. 30, 40, 50, 60 kilometers. Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I thought, because the, the ocean crust, as I understand, is quite thin, about yes. five kilometers. Yeah. Right. And then the continental crust is this much thicker stuff that rides higher and floats higher on the mantle, I guess. Yeah, At least that's how I understand. It's significantly less dense. Okay, and, yeah. And, so, it's, and, it's more, and there's more thickness, yeah. And you're talking about uplifts of hundreds of kilometers in order to maintain a mountain's right. height at this height that it has now. That's more than the thickness of the actual continent that composes it. So 
yeah. it would lead, as you say, to another one of these kind of crustal cycles where the crust would have to be quite young in order to, to have mountains that tall. And yet the conventional dating says, no, the crust is very, very old. So again, we're left with this weird conundrum. So right. the only conclusion, I guess... Is like that paper you quoted that that just must have made a much lower erosion rate in the past because right. we still have really tall mountains that are very young, relatively speaking. And I guess I guess somebody could say, well, the activity of humans means that erosion rates on the continents are higher today yeah. than perhaps they were in the past. Yeah. But the question is, are they sufficiently higher today? Um, to compensate for the you know the, this this uh, conundrum that we've got this kind of shortfall. So the estimates that I've seen is that maybe it's twice as high. So it's not the orders of magnitude that you need. And the human activity we're talking about here would be things like clearing clearing land, deforestation in order to create farmland, which is mostly not trees, and the trees uh, actually absorb when it rains. The trees catch in a forest catch the vast majority of the rainwater that and uh so it doesn't actually hit the ground so uh and that's known just basically forest ecology studies can show that so most of the yeah. most of the water that falls as rain is being caught in the trees so it's not eroding anything and then you have all the root structures as well that's going to yeah. prevent the soil from just washing away um and so it's agriculture then that creates this this place where you can accelerate the the erosion yeah. of sediment especially when you freshly plow it and now right. it's just dirt but that's not and that's basically doubling the erosion rate is that what you've said on average that's what, I, that's what i've seen published yeah right and that's not that's not gonna do it <laughs> not nearly enough no no not nearly enough we we were we're we're needing erosion rates yeah 50 times lower in the past and we can say they may be half as much as they are now which that's not gonna cut it right but then the other thing is that you got to remember so you know even back in the jurassic you know they you know we you have these you know the grasses for example grasses haven't grasses and flowering plants according to the evolutionary time frame and, and right. narrative you know they haven't been around for that long that's right yeah that so you too. don't have all of that <laughs> ground cover to stabilize everything for a lot yeah. of earth's history this is very interesting it's it's a very complex uh subject as well because there's so many different factors that that need to be taken into account but there is one other um aspect of this erosion question that i wanted to sort of address if we could before um we sort of close out this episode and that concerns um, evidence of ancient erosion. So obviously material that is eroded ends up somewhere. It gets deposited. And one of the striking things that we see in the ancient rock record is that we have these um, widespread, flat-lying, very extensive sedimentary layers that blanket the continents. And those layers of sediment have built up in a kind of pancake fashion one on top of another, the oldest at the bottom of the sequence, uh, getting younger as you go, you go up through the uh, sequence of layers. But that sequence of layers is not complete in any one place. There are yeah. effectively gaps. So tell us about the erosion problem concerning those gaps uh, in, in, the, in the Earth's rock record. Could you sort of talk us through it. Okay, so sometimes there's a lot of, there is evidence of a lot of erosion. Um, as you can see at the great unconformity at the base of the Cambrian here in the Grand Canyon, there's a there's supposedly a, a 1.2 billion year gap right there. Many contacts, however, are only considered unconformities based on time and not physical evidence. So this is a six million year gap in between the Hermit Shale and the Coconino Sandstone in the Grand Canyon. Uh, you know, it, it's just it's this flat contact. You know, one, there was, you know, the reddish shale was deposited and then sand right on top of it and, you know, very little disturbance in between the layers. This is a 15 to 40 million year gap between the Molenkopi and the Shinrup in, you know, out here in the West United States as well. And again, you know, just no real evidence of time passage between those two layers. Here's a 50 million year gap. And this one, there is significantly more erosion 
but it's still a pretty flat flat layer flat contact when you look at the area the total area of the contact and so so to explain what's going on here uh this is a diagram from my book and you can see that the geologist on the left is looking at at a bunch of rock layers and there's this red sandstone you know above the layer that he's standing on well the other geologist is looking at a different at the same same you know same layers of rocks but the red layer is missing where she's standing mm -hmm. you know and maybe that's a few hours drive by car or whatever and so when that happens you know if this red sandstone is supposed to have been deposited over six million years well then they say oh well there's a six million year gap between the you know the purple layer and the the tan layer she's standing on and we we see that uh, the the coconino and the hermit for example if you drive south from grand canyon so you go to kind of the area of S sedona there's a thick formation between the hermit formation and the coconino called the schnebly hill right which must right. have been deposited in that gap so the question becomes how long did it take for that formation to be deposited right so this right so this is a picture of the missing schnebly hill right yeah, <laughs> and you know, and and here there's quite a bit more missing because this is Shenner up here, and this is Shenner up here, and the, there's the Molenkopi is gone here. This is Permian yeah. down here now. So how can we get a handle on how much time is actually missing there at that at that boundary? You know, what what should we be looking for to give us some clues about the the time involved? Well. You know, if we you know, back to our previous discussions on erosion, erosion, I mean, it happens over human lifetimes. Um, and so to say that you could get a beautiful flat contact sitting there for as much as 40 million years, I mean, that's, that's just, you know, that's a pretty wild claim. So Adam Sedgwick was one of Darwin's professors. And in The Spectator in April 7, 1860, he said... I think it would be very. I think it would be a very rash, rash assertion to affirm that a great geological interval took place between the formation of the upper part of the New Red Sandstone and the Leas. Physical evidence is against it. To support a baseless theory, Darwin would require a countless lapse of ages of which we have no commensurate physical monuments. And we see this over and over again. Ariel Roth compiled a lot of this paleoconformity data. You know all these flat gaps. You know, he, and when you look at everything that he compiled, you can shrink the geologic column, the time of the geologic column. You know, in other words, it, let's go back to, to this one right here. And let's just take the take this outcrop at face value and say, you know, there wasn't much time there. Obviously, there wasn't much time. Um, well, that shrinks whatever's supposed to be between there down to not much time. You know, if we if we look at this other one and say, well, obviously that's not six million years, so the Schneebly Hill didn't didn't take six million years to deposit that. And if we do that for all of the places where these flat gaps occur, you can basically just collapse, you know, the, the vast majority of the geologic column. So what so what you're saying, um, just just to try and sort of make sure I've got this. So we ought to be seeing if if this gap here, if this time gap is really six million years, we should see physical evidence of erosion at that boundary at that junction because erosion eats into the layers it creates topography erodes gullies and canyons for example how how long um would it take to to form a you know a, a hundred foot deep canyon um a, and yet this contact right. looks very flat it, it doesn't look as if there's uh much in the way of erosion on that surface right well, when i was a kid i lived in a house next to a hill and we had a big rainstorm one day and the next morning um, I went out, it, we, we were out in the desert. So we get there, it was a flash flood area and went out the next morning and there was a canyon probably eight feet deep and 15 feet across, you know, not, not too far from the house. Um, and that's just one rain, one night, just yeah. one night of yeah. rain. One, yeah. one night of rain. Yeah. You know, and that was just a rainstorm. It wasn't, it wasn't a common occurrence because we didn't get that canyon. I mean, the canyon wasn't there before. You know, that, that, that's the kind of thing you expect with, with any significant precipitation. Could you, um, playing devil's advocate here, could you have erosion over an extensive area that in effect creates a flat surface rather than a, an uneven surface? Is, is that possible? Uh, I would say in a word, no. Like, look, so you see these, these layers in the Moenkopi, in the in the lower the, the darker formation here you know these these lamina and these you know these these layers of this of the moenkopi you know they stretch for long distances and 
you would expect some kind of erosion into that and yet it's just not there now there are occasional very occasionally we'll find troughs carved into the monkopi at this contact and so there was some erosion again very occasionally it's it's not uh, not not a common occurrence you know and then another issue is that we very often find load casts in the monocopy at this contact okay Ex- explain to us what you mean by a load cast <laughs> yeah okay. so so the shinrup is a conglomerate uh, right here it's it looks like a sandstone but yeah and it, it is a sandstone in many areas but there there are often cobbles at the base of the shinrup and so you 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 expect well, anyway, so those cobbles actually push down into the soft mud of the Moenkopi when they were when they were deposited, um, and they left these these marks in the Moenkopi of all of these cobbles that got pushed down into the mud. And then similarly, mm-hmm. uh, the reason I took this picture is because this was found to be an injectite. So this uh, John Whitmore just did some fascinating research on these injectites and. So this sandstone was supposedly deposited again six million years after the deposition of the shale. Um, now shale's uh, not perhaps I mean, it's called the hermit shale, but this is actually pretty sandy. And these were thought to be desiccation cracks, but there's too much sand for desiccation desiccation cracks to form in this material. And when John looked at these uh, at the at these injectites, he he found a bunch of evidence of of that this material was injected was fluidized and injected. Um, and so you have, again, supposedly a six million year gap, but then you've got everything kind of soft. So yeah. it's, it's yeah, that's what I was just going to say. You're saying that not only is there six million years where it's not eroding, yeah, which I could maybe plausibly imagine happens if you have really hard rock surface, but you're telling me that it's actually still soft by the time the next layer gets deposited six million years later. Yeah, well, and, and on that, that's actually a good point, too. So if it were hard rock, let's say granite basalt, um, it would weather and turn to soil in, in at least a few thousand years. Oh, okay. maybe hundreds, right? <laughs> OK. And so you you get soil horizons mm-hmm. on on granite pretty quickly in geological timescales. And you just don't see that. And actually, the problem the problem here with the injectites is probably even worse because it's not just six million years. Because the most likely time that the injection happened, the forceful injection, was around the time of the Laramide um, uplift, yes. I think, where where right. there was movement on the Bright Angel Fault. Because um, the, so the, yeah, these injectites are actually lined up with the fault, oh. and, and they get bigger and deeper closer to the fault. So oh. the actual injection, so the injection happened in the conventional time scale, um, many tens of millions of years after the deposition of both the hermit and the coconino. Okay, <laughs> wait, wait a minute here. I got to put this all together here because this is mind blowing. So we have the deposition of this this darker shale, and then we have a deposition of a lighter colored material on top of it that's supposedly separated by a six million year gap. And then tens of millions of years later, there is crack, a fault in the, in the ground. Uh, there's movement along that fault. And that causes these injectite. And I'm, I'm going to have to ask you, what exactly is the injectite? What's happening at that point? Uh, well, okay, so the, the upper, the lighter material is coconino sandstone. Okay. And at the base, you can see that it's been fluidized. In other words, yeah. the sedimentary structure has been disturbed and little chunks have been kind of rolled around. And that's that fluidized material was what got shot down into the hermit. So why does it shoot down into the hermit? What what is it is the hermit basically cracking because of the earthquake fault that's 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 right. causing the stuff to ooze down into it? Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the her- cracks are opening up in the hermit and the flu the, the fluidized coconino is being forcefully injected down into those cracks in effect. Got so it. Got yeah, it. and you can you can actually see inside the inside the material in the cracks. You can see flow structures and broken fragments and you know all all the the kind of evidence that this was not just sand that was blown into these cracks because right. they were desiccation cracks, but it was actually fluidized sand that was forcefully intruded in into the underlying material. Yep. So the whole thing would have to be mostly soft fluid stuff 
for yep. millions and millions of years. Yeah, to remobilize it. For this yep. thing to happen the way it is. It's another time conundrum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's another one of those time conundrums. Yeah, we keep running into those. So uh, we should probably start to um, sort of summarize some of this and sort of wind this episode up. This, again, has been another deep dive. Uh, we've done you know, two of these episodes where we've really just focused on one issue, which is erosion and what it can tell us about geological time. And in effect, we have a way of testing the radiometric time scale. We can we can say, well, look, you know, if let's assume for a moment that the radiometric dates are correct. What should we expect to see in, in the rock record? What should we expect of erosion rates? And um, when we actually look at those erosion rates, we find there's a conflict that, that they, these things don't match up. And it ought to be causing us to sort of have a question mark, I think, about those radiometric dates, about the radiometric time scale. So we've, we've looked at um, coastal erosion rates in the last episode. We, today we've, we've looked at um, erosion by rivers. We've, we've looked at uh, uh, uplift, mount, mountain uplift and mountain erosion rates. Uh, we've even looked at evidence of ancient erosion, uh, looking at these flat gaps in the rock record where we ought to see evidence of, you know, large amounts of physical erosion, which seems to be lacking. And all of it kind of points essentially to this conflict with the with the standard radiometric time scale. Monty, is there anything else that we, we should say as we kind of, you know, just help to summarize this for our, our listeners? Well, sure. The, so the... Um, kind of at the interface between coastal erosion and and this continental erosion, it is actually erosion of the continents that supplies sand to the beaches. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a lot of sand going to the beaches, it really helps out. It helps mitigate coastal erosion. But you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can't, like the, the sediment comes from somewhere. So that's, you know, that's one issue. Um, you know, even if you solve all of the problems with, with coastal erosion, for example, you still got all this material coming down from the continent and getting lost to the oceans. And, uh, erosion, of course, doesn't give us an exact date, but it really does help us constrain the age of the Earth. I think it's, you know, in my head, it's easier to say, I don't, you know, maybe there's some, maybe there's some something wrong with radiometric dating. And, you know, I, not, you know I've, 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 I've used it. I use radiometric dating. I understand it. We, I've used it to do uh, stratigraphic correlations, for example, um, and I think it's useful for that. Uh, but you know, even when we're generous, erosion rates show that the rock record is hundreds or even thousands of times younger than the radiometric dates would seem to indicate. So again, I mean, radi it, radiometric dating is useful, but I, I, you know, when the dates that it gives fall so far outside the realm of what is possible based on well understood you know, mechanical processes, uh, you know, I think we should, I think it, that, I think that's a really good reason to doubt the absolute dates. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So we, we don't want to throw any data out. We, we don't want to just dismiss yeah. radiometric dates. We, we need to understand them. Um, and that's, that's obviously what we want to do in this series is to try to sort of deepen our understanding of what the radiometric dates are really telling us. But, you know, likewise, we've got all of this erosion data and w and we need to we need to understand that too and somehow we need some kind of scientific model of earth history that helps us to bring all of this data together and explain as much of the data as we can so that that's that's what we're trying to 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 get to grips with here that's been really helpful now there are other things in your book <laughs> that we haven't <laughs> even begun to talk about and i hope that we can tempt you back onto the podcast to talk about those as well, because um, there are also some interesting conflicts with radiometric time when it comes to fossils, uh, you know, fossil burial, fossil preservation, um, preservation of organic tissues and things like that. So um, that's a topic that I think we could devote a whole episode to. Um, and I hope you'll come back at some point to talk to us about that. But this has been a, a, a fantastic deep dive. Um, we're very grateful Monty for you coming on and sparing your time to talk to us about all of this and talk us through it. So that's it for for this week. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, you know, dig, digging into this subject. Todd, we've got some fun things coming up. I guess people mm -hmm. are going to have to come back and find out 
um, you are. know, what's coming up next time. Uh, but for now, um, we'll, we'll say goodbye and uh, hope to see you in a fortnight's time. So bye for now. See you around. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.